So let me just say I'm very pleased to introduce Andrea Montanari from Stanford. Thanks, Roberto. Oh, thanks for the invitation. So this is going to be a survey talk about uh, some topics in high dimensional statistics that are closely related to uh, an area of statistical physics that is mean field models. Okay, since I don't assume the audience to know anything about statistics, I'll have one, actually two slides about what statistics or theoretical statistics is about. Okay, this is a simplification, but uh, basically the, the problem in statistical estimation is the following. You have a, a, an object of interest that you can think of as a vector in a, in a subset of a d-dimensional space, and then you have a probability kernel that for every value of this vector tells me a probability distribution over Rn. And so you are given one sample of this distribution, and what, what you want to do is to construct an estimator that is a function from Rn to Rt that spits out an estimate of theta. And uh, you know, if you want to understand the, the qualitative behavior of many of these problems, there is clearly a trade-off between how complex is the model, so how large is the dimension here, and how many data do you have. And this is, of course, an oversimplification, but I'll try to give you a flavor of what are different regimes by using these two parameters. Uh, classically, there are two regimes that have been studied. Now, classically, there is one main regime that has been studied that is, let's call the data-rich regime in which the amount of data is much larger than the dimension of the space of parameters. Right? So this dates back at least to Fisher, and the type of you know, results that people prove in this area, in this regime, is that you come up with an estimator that converges to theta zero as uh, the amount of data goes to infinity. Well, and then you can characterize rate of convergence and so on. In the last 10 years, uh, there is a different regime that has, has attracted most attention of theoretical statistician and is, let's call the high dimensional of data poor regime. And is a regime in which you have less, much less data than the ambient dimension. Surprisingly enough, you are able to estimate consistently. Why? Because this subset of parameter is highly structured. So theta doesn't belong to any, uh, is not any point in RT, but belong to some subset, for instance, the set of sparse vector. And so if you have more data than the effective dimension, then you still get consistency and convergence. Okay, so this is a surprising phenomenon that has uh, you know, far-reaching implication. Uh, in this talk, I'll focus uh, on a third regime that I'll call the, let's say, noisy high dimensional. And what I mean by this is that n and d go to infinity, often at proportional rate. And therefore, you don't have consistency, but uh, you have convergence of the pair theta hat to theta zero to some non-trivial limit. So even in the limit of an infinite many data, since the model complexity grow, you still have error. And because of that, I, I think of that as a noisy high dimensional regime in which we really don't neglect the importance of the noise. And so this is the plan of the talk. Uh, I'll focus on one simple example because it's the example on which most, you know, more things have been proved. It's not a particularly important example for applications, but in, I think it's good pedagogically. And I'll discuss what is base optimal estimation in this case, what are efficient algorithms, and then uh, something about generic or robust algorithms. All right, so I had to think hard to think of the simplest possible model, and I think this is the simplest possible model on which to study this phenomena. <laughs> you, an, you have an unknown vector theta zero, this is an n-dimensional vector, and what you observe is theta zero, theta zero transpose plus noise. So you observe a rank one matrix plus noise, and your objective is to estimate this uh, rank one matrix. Okay, so this is, again, my model. Here, theta zero is a vector in n dimension, and I'll normalize it in such a way that it has uh, L2 norm square root of n. The data is an n by n matrix, and the noise is uh, uh, 
uh, I'll take it the simplest possible noise that is Gaussian. So this is a matrix from the GOE ensemble. So entries on the diagonal are variance 2 over n and of the diagonal 1 over n and the matrix is symmetric. Okay, so if you if you think a moment about it, you see you notice that this matrix has typically entry of order one over n, and this has entries of order one over square root of n. So you really need to use the whole data to try to estimate theta zero. Okay. So I'm not interested in this problem in general. I'm interested in enforcing some structure on theta zero. So I have some prior information. And the way I will do this, and I will look at the empirical distribution of a vector theta. So this is a distribution that point puts mass 1 over n over each of the coordinates. And then I look at subsets of vectors of Rn whose empirical distribution matches some pre-assigned distribution. So this is all vectors that have a certain empirical distribution. And I want to be extremely simple, so I'll, I'll take this empirical distribution to take this simple form. With probability epsilon, you have one value, and with probability 1 minus epsilon, another value. And these two values are chosen in such a way that the mean is 0 and the variance is 1. You know, several of the results that I'll state actually apply to general P under some tail conditions, but uh, you know, I'll use this as my running example. Okay? So the problem again is I'm given a simple, single sample of this matrix and I want to estimate theta zero. There is an even simpler model, if you want to keep in mind, that is already quite interesting, is this Z2 synchronization problem in which this theta zero is just a plus minus one vector with half entries equal to plus one and the other half minus one. Right. So this is one matrix generated according to this model, one random matrix generated according to this model. So in this case, the vector theta 0 is plus 1 for the first n over 2 entries and minus 1 for the second n over 2 entries. I took the outer product and the added noise. And of course, you can see the, set, the, the low rank structure un underlying this. OK? Of course, in reality, data are not given in this form, but an arbitrary permutation, and the structure is much less obvious. And if you were here a couple of days ago, this is very similar to picture that you get in the stochastic block model. In fact, it's closely related model to the stochastic block model. OK, again, what is our goal? Our goal is to come up with an estimator that spits out a vector and they'll qualify the, you know, the quantity, the quality of this estimator by looking at the angle. I mean, I'll take the scalar product theta hat theta 0 and I'll normalize by the norm of the two vectors. So I'm looking at, the, you know, you have a vector that you want to estimate. You have an estimator. I look at the cosine of the angle. So if this is big, means that my method is working. And I'll take, a, you know, expectation over the data conditional on theta zero. Now, with respect to theta zero, one can do two things. One can take the worst case over theta zero, or one can take theta zero uniformly random in subset. In this specific example, these two are essentially the same. Just by symmetry of the problem, this worst case uh, estimation error is basically the same as the Bayesian estimation error. Okay, so I, I don't have to care too much about the difference between the two. Okay, just to give an example of a very simple uh, benchmark method, you know, a natural thing, since this is a rank one matrix plus noise, a natural thing to do is just to take the uh, eigenvalue decomposition of the matrix and take the principal eigenvector as my estimator. And if you take the principal eigenvector, you get some performance that is some scalar product between theta hat and theta zero. And the performance looks like this in the limit n to infinity is zero up to lambda equal one. So lambda will play a crucial role, is the strength on the signal in my model. So when the signal is not strong, there is a lot of noise I cannot estimate, and then I can estimate with some positive correlation. And this curve can be computed exactly thanks to this theorem. So this is uh, you know, a pretty basic uh, you know, and 
important theorem in random matrix theory by Baik, Benarus, and Peche, in which they computed the scalar product in the limit n to infinity. They proved that it takes this form, the square root of 1 minus 1 over lambda square positive part. In particular, it's 0 for lambda less than 1 and it's strictly positive for lambda less, uh, bigger than 1. And this is exactly that curve. Now, this is a nice random matrix theory result, but if you look at it from a statistics perspective, there is a natural question that is, can I do better? And this question brings up a lot of interesting mathematics. Okay, so again, I'll go over Bayes' optimal estimation, then efficient algorithm, and gen then generic or robust algorithms. Okay, so what is Bayes' optimal estimation? Well, you have you can compute what is, you can write down, you know, uh, at least more or less explicitly, what is the, con the, the posterior distribution of theta given observation x. Okay? And this turns out to take the simple form, it's the prior times the likelihood function by Bayes' theorem, and the likelihood function takes this kind of Gibbs form in which is exponential of a quadratic form in theta plus something uh, related to the norm of theta. And now the Bayes' optimal estimator will be take the conditional expectation of theta given x, so integrate theta over this measure. And okay, this is not quite the end of the story. For epsilon 0 0.5, there is a degeneracy that you have to take care of, but I'll skip this technical detail. Okay, so this is you know, uh, you know, an implicit form. By itself, it doesn't tell us a lot about what is the, the estimator, but one you know, useful observation for you know, using the right tool is that this is very similar to a spin glass model. So if you think about it, this is similar to the you know, Hamiltonian of a spin model in which you have pairwise interaction and coupling sex, and then there is this, this term that doesn't appear you know, normally in spin glasses, but is not too important. Not only is a spin glass model, but turns out was understood you know, quite some time ago already that this model is, is uh, replica symmetric. Okay? So for those of you that know something about spin glasses, this means a lot. For those of you that don't know anything about spin glasses, I'll try to explain in a few words what this is. Okay? So the definition that is normally given is the following. Imagine of doing the following experiment. You sample a matrix from your uh, model, from the base distribution. And then given that matrix, you sample two vectors from the posterior independently. So these are conditionally independent, but not, they are not independent because you're using the same x. So unconditionally, they are dependent. And then you ask yourself, what is the scalar product between these two vectors? When you rescale it, this is a number between 0 and 1, or minus 1 and 1. And replica symmetry means that this converges in probability to a non-random number, Q star. And so this is what it is. Now, for those of you that are uh, not into spin glasses, this is a little bit uh, not particularly intuitive, but it's roughly uh, equivalent to the following uh, uh, property. If you take a single vector from the base posterior, and if you take two coordinates of this vector, two distinct coordinates, these are approximately independent. And this approximately, of course, has to be uh, you know, quantified and made a little bit precise, but this is the, the, the implication of this fact. Okay, so thanks to this replica property, one compute, can compute a lot of properties of the posterior. So here I'm quoting a result by, that was obtained more or less independently by two groups, but with different assumptions. And the result says following, assume that this model is correct and define the following function. So this is a function of my signal to noise ratio lambda and of an extra parameter gamma. And it's completely explicit apart from this term i of gamma. And what is i of gamma? Well, i of gamma is the mutual information between x0 that is distributed like my prior p and an observation of x0 in Gaussian noise. Okay, so if you don't know what is the mutual information, it's simply this expectation. Now, now this might seem completely implicit, but this is a conditional expectation over two, an expectation over two scalar uh, variables, so it's basically two-dimensional integral. 
Essentially, this I of gamma can be computed by computing a two-dimensional integral. So it's a very simple object. So take this function psi and maximize this function psi over gamma. So the maximum of them, this I'll call gamma base. And the theorem says the following. If you look at the scalar product, this accuracy metric, this converges to square root of gamma base over lambda. Okay? So this tells me precisely what is the base optimal uh, estimation accuracy for large uh, system, large matrices. And uh, okay, so I should mention that this is uh, two papers, but this is related to you know both papers that came before and you know and the special cases of this theorem, and then that came after that have uh, you know more precise versions of this theorem. And the theorem doesn't only tells you this; tells you a lot more. But for simplicity, I'll keep it at this. Okay. Now this curve, this gamma bias, can be computed very quickly, and this is the curve that you obtain. Is zero for this is for epsilon zero five is zero till lambda equal one, and then becomes strictly positive, and becomes strictly larger than uh, uh, the PCA curve, the principal component analysis. So this basically tells you that this random matrix theory result is a nice mathematical result, but it's not a fundamental result in statistics term. It's just the performance of some suboptimal method. Okay. Uh, interestingly, if you go at uh, uh, epsilon small, so if you make your vector somehow sparse, the behavior is uh, even more interesting in the sense that the base optimal curve becomes positive at a point strictly below one. So if this is a point at which if you look at the matrix, if you look at the eigenvalues of the matrix, there is no eigenvalue coming out of the bulk. There is a pure semicircle, but if you do base optimal estimation, you see something. Okay? And interestingly, this is a discontinuous jump here, and you can analytically continue this curve. So it is a branch that has, doesn't have really an interpret. I mean, it has an interpretation, but I will not discuss it here. And uh, so it has a spinodal point. Okay, so this is the picture. This picture tells me that if I do PCA, I achieve some accuracy. If I do base optimal estimation, I can do significantly better. Um, this can be encouraging, but am I really happy with this? And the answer is not really. I'm not really happy because uh, this analysis tells me that there is an estimator, but doesn't give me an algorithm. Now, the only algorithm is to integrate this n dimensional distribution, and I cannot do it in polynomial time. So I'm looking for a polynomial time algorithm. And let me give you the property of one specific algorithm that we call approximate message passing. And uh, this generally works in this way. You start with an estimate theta, uh, theta 0, that is a vector in n dimension. And each step, what you do is that you compute some nonlinear function of theta. You hit it with the matrix, and uh, you subtract some correction. Okay. So you, one way to think about it is that you are doing some kind of nonlinear power iteration. If you were to compute just the principal eigenvector, one way to do it numerically is keep multiplying the same vector by x. So you start by theta 0, multiply by x, multiply by x, etc. So if you take f equal the identity function, then this algorithm is just the power iteration method basically to compute the principal eigenvector. Here, you might argue, I know, for instance, that the entries have you know, some specific support. I'll, I'll use my nonlinear function to enforce this constraint. I know that the entries are bounded. I'll use my nonlinear function to enforce at each iteration that they are, unbound, that they are bounded. Okay? This is actually something that doesn't come out of the blue. Is, you know, one thing to think about it is a, you know, a generalization that's something that appears again in spin glass theory that is an iterative method to solve top equations. And is closely related to something that has been studied for a while in information theory and in artificial intelligence that is called belief propagation. Okay, so let me tell you in, in brief why this algorithm is interesting. One reason why it's interesting is that it can be analyzed exactly. 
And this is uh, the heuristic. This heuristic is completely wrong, uh, mathematically, but gives the right result. And the heuristic is the following. Suppose that at some time t, you know that your vector is a constant time the true vector plus a Gaussian noise. Suppose that by some magic, you know that that is true. <laughs> then what I'm doing is hitting this vector by my matrix X. My matrix X is a rank one matrix plus noise. When you look at this rank one, ma one matrix, you get a coefficient times theta zero. So you have a coefficient times theta zero. And then what I'm doing, while well, I'm multiplying a Gaussian matrix times a vector, what I'll get is a Gaussian vector. No? Okay. Of course, it's if, if a student gives you this as a proof, you should give him a bad or her a bad grade. But uh, you know, it turns out that in this case, the, the, because you are neglecting the dependence in between w and theta hat, but it turns out that in this case, it is correct because of this correction term. And out of it, you get a nonlinear iteration for this parameter mu and sigma. So if f is separable, what happens is that mu evolves in this way. So it's some function of mu and sigma at the previous iteration, and sigma is some other function of mu and sigma at the previous iteration. And this is, these expectations are just two-dimensional integrals with respect to these measures. Huh? So this is the correlation between x0 and f, and this is the variance of f. Okay. So this type of analysis has an important practical consequence. It tells you uh, how should you construct your nonlinear function f. What you want to do is, at each iteration, you would like to optimize the signal-to-noise ratio. So you would all like to optimize mu over sigma. So you want to optimize the ratio of this to the square root of this. And by Cauchy-Schwarz, this is just uh, achieved when f is the posterior expectation with respect to uh, this observation. So it's the expectation of x0, conditional expectation of x0, given a noisy observation of x0 to a Gaussian channel. Uh -huh. So this is the algorithm that we, we run, uh, and uh, I'll state a result about. The algorithm at each iteration, it does this long linear operation. This again is something that is easy to compute, and then multiplies by x and subtract the correction term. And there's initialization. It's important to take a non-trivial initialization. I'll take the PCA initialization. And this is a theorem about this, this uh, algorithm. It says the following. If you take your vector, your data according to the model, and if the signal noise ratio is above one, then the following happens. Define the same uh, you know, funny function as before. And now instead of maximize this function, I'll take the first local maximum. I'll take the first critical point, the critical point with the smallest value of gamma. Oh, and there will be critical points. This is easy to see. And I'll take the first one. And this has to be computed compared with the base gamma that is the critical point with the maximum value. OK, so in general, this will be smaller than that. So the theorem says that if you look at this algorithm and you let the size of your data go to infinity and the number of iterations go to infinity, then the performance that you get is exactly square root of this gamma alg over uh, lambda. And in fact, the convergence is exponentially fast. So this limit t to infinity is in practice realized after just a few iterations. No. So this again is related to, to, to a bunch of earlier paper. I want just to point out a paper by Erwin Bolthausen in the spin glass literature that developed some, uh, you know, an important technique to prove, that we use to prove this theorem. Okay, so this is uh, a simulation about this, in which I take again epsilon 0 0.5. This is, uh, now I draw in purple, the prediction of this theorem, which in this case you can show that coincides with the Bayes optimal curve, and the red are simulation points obtained using this algorithm, and you see that the algorithm basically achieved the Bayes optimal curve. Okay. So very nice. Uh, these are simulation for the case of sparse vectors, so epsilon 0.025. And uh, something interesting happens. Uh, the theorem says that you will achieve this curve only above lambda equal 1. And indeed, what happens is that below lambda equal 1, uh, 
uh, the algorithm doesn't spit out anything. No, doesn't achieve a positive correlation between with the ground truth. No? So here something very interesting is happening. The, the, you know that the base optimal curve becomes positive at this information theoretic phase transition, and what happens is that the algorithmic curve becomes positive at the different phase transition, and there is a gap between these two. Right. So if you see this, you might say, okay, this is just a problem uh, with your algorithm. You are just too silly to build a good enough algorithm. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we thought and many people thought about these problems and about related problems, and nobody could come up with an improvement. And this, and you know, this together with uh, you know, consideration from physics, brought up this conjecture that no polynomial time algorithm can beat this curve. Right. So there is no polynomial time algorithm that will reach this blue part, blue branch of the curve. No, so this is, a, of course, an extremely difficult conjecture to prove, but okay, the only way we know how to make progress of it is analyze specific algorithms so far. Okay, so now this is the picture. Uh, uh, we improved a lot of our principal component analysis. We achieved the bias optimal curve above lambda equal one. We have this gap. We don't know how to prove it, but we believe this gap is a fundamental gap, and you, know, you are welcome to work on that. Am I satisfied with this? And again, I'm not really satisfied, and the reason is that if you look at the way I constructed this algorithm, I really very carefully exploited the distribution of my data and properties of the distribution of the, my data. For instance, the fact that the noise was IID. I didn't use much the Gaussian assumption, but the IID noise, yes. And this is not something that I want for an algorithm, because the data will never be IID. Right, so in the rest of the talk, I'll, fix to the, I'll stick to this case 0 0.5, because that is hard enough. Uh, but hopefully, you know, some of these techniques can be generalized to other distribution. So this is the very simple Z2 synchronization problem. Okay, so what is the prototype of an algorithm that is kind of insensitive of the distribution? One prototype is maximum likelihood. What is maximum likelihood in this context is simply the following. You have given your matrix X, and you find the plus minus one vector that maximizes this quadratic form. Okay, so if you fell asleep so far, this is by itself an interesting problem. Uh, I'm maximizing a quadratic form over the hypercube. This is a very interesting estimator because it's meaningfully respective of the model. You know, whatever is the model on X, computing this vector has some meaning. And uh, you know, it's easy to prove robustness result. If you change X by something of small operator norm, then, you know, Okay, depending really of the value, but often sigma will not change too much. Unfortunately, this problem is NPR, of course. Okay. So a standard way to deal with the fact that this problem is hard to solve in computer science is to construct a relaxation, a semi-definite programming relaxation. So let me explain to you what this means. Okay. So we have this problem. I wrote it uh, in an equivalent way simply by writing the scalar product as a product between sig x and sigma sigma transpose. This is the scalar product between matrices when you vectorize them. And uh, you know, equivalent formulation to this is maximize x times z over all n by n matrices that are positive semi-definite rank 1 have the diagonal entries equal to 1. It's easy to check that if you take this any matrix that satisfies these properties, you can write it as the outer product of a plus minus one vector with itself. All right, so these two formulations are completely equivalent. I just lifted my variable to a larger space. And now in a relaxation, you drop this constraint. Uh -huh. Once you drop this constraint, what happens is something very nice, that the remaining problem is positive semi-definite because this is z in the positive semi-definite cone, and then these are linear constraints. Right, so this is the SDP uh, for data x. Huh? So if I solve this problem, this will spit out a matrix z star. 
I can solve it you know, to arbitrary accuracy in polynomial time. What I'll do with this Z star, well, I have to come up with a vector. Uh, here are two ways to come up with a vector. One is that I do the eigenvalue decomposition of Z and I take the maximum eigenvector. And the other is, so this is the best in practice, but the one for which we prove theorems, one theorem is this one, is in which we sample theta according to a Gaussian with covariance. Z star. Uh -huh. So what do we know about these methods? Uh, in reality, we don't know a whole lot, but we know that uh, you know, for the simple model as the optimal phase transition. <laughs> so if you take this model, uh, so theta zero is a plus minus one vector, and you set yourself above the phase transition that is one in this point, then uh, you know, the limit of this correlation is strictly positive. Okay. And uh, again, this SDP has also been studied in a number of papers. Most of these papers actually focus on a different regime that is basically the regime in which lambda goes to infinity at some rate with n. There is uh, a very nice work by Gedon and Vershinin that also focus on a lambda of order one, but they need lambda to be a big enough constant. While here, but they have a more general result. Here, the model is more specific, but we need, uh, uh, we get the exact threshold, the sharp threshold. You might wonder, okay, can we compute the whole curve of accuracy of this algorithm? Uh, now, as a background, I'm a physicist, as a, I'm a physicist and as a, as a physicist, I know that I cannot always prove things, but I can always compute them. Okay, so with, with uh, Java Martin Ricci, we computed what is this limit using physics method, and we got an explicit formula. So this is a conjecture that would be interesting to prove. And the explicit formula is kind of non-trivial. You solve three nonlinear equations that are integrals within, with respect to this random variable g and rho, and then uh, you get the solution, mu q, you stick it to, into a, a cumulative Gaussian function and a Gaussian distribution, and this is your limit. And if you evaluate this expression, this gives you now the purple curve, that is the theoretical performance at SDP. It has the phase transition at one, as predicted by model, by our theorem. Uh, but it has a nice curve. It's actually very close to the base optimal curve and quite a bit better than principal component analysis. And uh, if you run large-scale simulation, they match very well with, with the theory. Okay. Okay, so this is what the performance of SDP is. Uh, uh, it's nearly base optimal, it's practical computational, it's generic robust, but the analysis is still incomplete. Okay, so am I happy with this? And perhaps you understood by now that I'm never happy. And, and I, I would like to close this gap. You know, even assume that I can prove this conjecture that I, I did I didn't prove, uh, you are welcome to work on it. I would like to close this small gap. At least conceptually, I think this is kind of very interesting. All right, so here is an attempt at closing uh, this gap, is an attempt that will not work completely, but, uh, but here is an attempt. Uh, I define the following cost function. This is now not a cost function defined on plus minus one, but on one minus one, close the interval, right? This takes a vector, uh, and you see, this is the maximum likelihood function. So the energy term, I put add to it an entropy term and then another, basically, entropy term. And if you neglect this for a moment, uh, you know, this is a term, uh, what is this? This is the entropy of a plus minus one random variable that has mean expectation mi, okay? So if you think about it, what this is doing, if lambda is small, this has a lot, lot of weight, and is shrinking my m towards zero. And this makes a lot of sense. If I don't have a lot of signal, I don't want to commit myself and saying this is a plus one or a minus one. I'd rather say this is 0 0.5. All right, so this you can think of as a regularizer that is pushing things towards zero, where you are, we are, you are not really certain. And physics suggests that the, the conditional expectation, the posterior expectation, which is the base estimate, is closer, close to the minimizer of this function. 
And OK, here there is uh, this usual symmetry problem. OK, so I should mention this function we didn't invent it, was introduced in spin glasses by Thaules, Anderson, and Palmer in 77. Okay, so what is the interpretation of this function is the following. What you would like to compute is the base posterior. Suppose that I could minimize the base posterior, uh, the KL divergence between any distribution P and the base posterior subject to the distribution P having mean mu. Okay, and then uh, by minimizing this function, you, you will get the posterior conditional expectation. Okay, so this is... The, the physics interpretation of this function is the minimum KL divergence between P and the real you know, Gibbs measure over all measures that have mean M. Uh, and this is, you know, this physics conjecture has been studied in probability theory, uh, and there is work by, of course, uh, Shurav, Chatterjee, Michel Telegrand, and many others. Uh, so what we would like to do is define an estimator by minimizing this. This is a non-convex uh, uh, optimization problem, but uh, what AMP is doing, this algorithm is looking for stationary points, so this suggests that this minimization problem is not too hard, and it's a robust problem in the same way as maximum likelihood is robust. And the question is, can we prove anything about it? And what we would like to prove about this cost function is that somehow, despite the fact that this is heavily non-convex, the landscape of this function is simple. And what this means really is that I can minimize it. This is the first thing I would like to prove. And the second thing is that the global minimum is actually the posterior expectation. All right, so this is what we prove. This uh, is something that hopefully will appear on the archive next week. Look at the set of all critical points of this function that are not too bad, okay? that are some positive correlation with the data. Okay? You can get some positive correlation, for instance, by PCA. So go below a certain level, and this is not a particular high level. Okay? Then uh, if lambda is above a certain lambda zero big enough, what we prove is that all the critical points are the posterior expectation converge to the posterior expectation. And, okay, we use this funny metric just because we have to take care of the fact that there is a plus minus one uh, ambiguity. No? So this theorem basically is saying uh, that the landscape of, of this function is exactly as we would like, that is at this global minimum, or all global minimum, are very close to the, all local minima are very close to the global minimum and are very close to the posterior expectation. Okay? And this, we, 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 we prove it basically by analyzing the landscape of this function by uh, the cuts rice formula method. As I mentioned before, there is earlier work on the TAP equation of TAP free energy, but prove results that cannot be used for this purpose. Those results are of the form, if you look at the posterior expectation, these are approximately stationary point of the, of the TAP free energy, but we want the converse. We want the stationary points are posterior expectation. Okay, wrapping up. So I took a simple model and I outlined the research program. And uh, the reason for the simple model is really that this is the case in which more steps of this program have been carried out. But this, a priori, it's interesting for any stati high dimensional statistical model. That is, you know, you can try to study high dimensional base posterior, and this will give you the fundamental statistical limits in many of these model, these message passing algorithms give you the computational limits or are conjectured to give the computational limits. Convex relaxation gives you a systematic way to construct robust algorithms. And uh, you know, interestingly, you can improve over naive cost function by using uh, free energy approximations. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, questions? We do have some time for those. Um, hello. <clears throat> Can you comment um, about this relation 
uh, between this uh, message passing algorithm you're using and the loopy belief propagation that you mentioned and also is this free energy you use at the end related to better free energy because mm -hmm. you have this correspondence right. between belief propagation fixed points and right so things. yeah so you know the relation with the uh, loopy belief propagation is one way to think about it is that this is uh, you know what you obtain from loopy belief propagation if you consider the case of uh, high degree graph graphs and and you look at you know you do some approximation that follows from the high degree right so if you think about it the problem that i studied i discussed today is a problem on a complete graph i have the full matrix you can define the same problem on a sparse random graph in that case uh, loopy belief propagation would be the the correct inference algorithm and the two are connected by taking the limit of large degree and the same is for the free energy okay now the nice fact about the high degree is and uh, your know, complete graph first is that these are still remain interesting model and second the math becomes a little bit uh, more tractable any more questions um, I would like to ask you is uh, this uh, message passing algorithm algorithm related with the expectation maximization algorithm so yeah no, it's re related to expectation propagation. Uh, okay, I cannot go into you know, fine discussion of how, but uh, okay, expectation propagation is a general strategy, and uh, you know there is a connection between the two. Okay. Okay. And another question. Okay. Uh, and in in your last uh, slide, where you show that the the this limit between the estimator and the Bayesian estimator is related with the, the 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 information Bayesian information criterion that in the limit approximates the Bayesian estimator. You think there is some relationship or? Well, this is something that you cannot really derive from general principles and will not always be true. This is basically saying that the free energy approximation that I'm using is correct. Since this is an approximation, a priori is not clear that is asymptotically correct. It is not clear that you get this kind of consistency. And in fact, you know, one standard thing in in, in the field, you know, in, in in Bayesian statistics, is to do mean field approximation that amounts to, in the simple model, dropping this term. So you minimize the KL divergence over product measure, and you get the free energy with, without that term. And you know, one simple thing that, uh, one not to hard thing that you can prove is that that will give you wrong result. So this theorem will be wrong if you do naive mean field. And naive mean field is what is used, uh, for instance, for inference in topic model is kind of used in really thousands of papers. Thank you. We have time for one quick question, if anybody's interested. Uh, well, if not, let's thank Andrea again. <laughs>